Welcome to episode 73 of the AskShell.com podcast. We are answering emails from AskShell.com club members. If you have a question for myself, Morgan, or for Shell, you too can submit a question. Good day, Shell. How are you? I am absolutely top drawer, as I always say, Morgan. And uh, I would like to say as well that uh, the questions are coming in hot and heavy. And uh, folks, if you have a question, or your neighbor, or you're out to dinner, and uh, some uh, guests had a question, and you said, hey, call Shell Buzzy, well, that's what you uh, have to do. Get in touch with us either by calling the office or, better yet, become a member of the AskShell.com club. Costs nothing. Yes, our office is open Monday to Friday from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., but you can send an email to Shell through AskShell.com 24-7, 365 days a year. Absolutely. 365 days a year. By golly, I'll tell you. And look at that just around the corner. Christmas. Oh, don't scare me. Like that, <laughs> uh, well, we certainly want to remember those as well coming up on Remembrance Day. On yes, November we've both got the poppies going. You and uh, on the, this week's show, we're going to talk about your uh, your first Ombudsman blog that we've put out there uh, in yes, the interwebs. Yes, sir. We've what? got a question and answer by Tony Giaventu, the executive director of the Condominium mm-hmm. Homeowners Association. He will be answering strata questions. Right on. Uh, some emails I have for you. Removing caulk that has gotten onto a toilet seat. How the caulk can get on the toilet seat? Not very good if you're sitting on it. <laughs> you, you won't be getting up. <laughs> That's for sure. Uh, how long it takes to bring humidity down in your home. Is PEX pipe good for an outdoor faucet? A uh, garage heating concern and a cultured marble sink repair. It's just that easy, by golly. Let's get at her pit or patter. First email is short and seat. Short, short and seat. seat. The toilet seat. <laughs> <laughs> I was re- looking right at All it. All right. What can I do? I have a toilet seat that got cocked on it. How can I remove it? Well, first of all, folks, it's cocking on it, and that's uh, very likely something in the line of... Uh, Maybe caulking around the bathtub or around the uh, bathroom sink. And guess what? You sat the tube on the toilet seat and uh, bingo, you got caulking on the toilet seat. So taking caulking off, if it's water-based or if it's acrylic latex, very simply take it off with warm water. That's all you need. Good, before good hot water. Well, you can even take it off after, it, after uh, it's dried. Uh, uh, well, it. you know, I mean, if it's been dry for a month or something like that, no. But uh, if it's been uh, there overnight, absolutely. But uh, really, when it comes right down to removing it, there's caulking removal material out there. There's some that comes in a tube. There's some that comes in a bottle. And it is very simple to apply. Just follow the instructions on the bottle. But there's no uh, uh, household uh, uh, formula or recipe that you can mix up uh, with uh, general house uh, uh, purchase uh, products. No, you, you got to go to the building supply store or the hardware store, pick yourself up a bottle of uh, uh, caulking uh, removal, and it is uh, something that's very simple and very easy to do. So there you have it, folks. Uh, just look it up in your local building supply store or hardware store and uh, put it on a cloth, follow instructions, and where you go. So if you see it there, get it on it as soon as you can. Oh, yeah. I mean, get it on it right bag. away. I mean, it's uh, it's it very likely it's smeared now. And uh, the smearing is what really uh, uh, causes the frustration because when it's smeared, then you got that film. And that film is what you're trying to take off now. So if it's, if it's uh, a water-based or a, a latex acrylic, just take it off with good warm water at the time. But if it's a silicone uh, caulking, silicone caulking, you will need the silicone caulking or caulking removing liquid material that comes in a tube or also in a bottle. But it's available at all your building supply stores. Excellent. Yeah. Next email. How long should it take to get a bathroom humidistat fan from 50 to 40 when the temperature is around 5 degrees Celsius outside? Well, you know, it's an interesting question, first of all, Morgan, and... uh, but it's a, it's a question that uh, unless you really understand moisture levels, relative humidity it's called, within the home, then really 
why are you wanting to remove moisture to a level that at this time of the year is virtually impossible? I mean, if it's raining outside, you're talking about anywhere from 80 to 100% relative humidity. It's raining, right. and the moisture level is high. And then when it's raining, it's cloud, it's overcast, it's low pressure. So therefore, you open a door, you open a window, that air carrying that moisture is going to whoosh into the house. And your furnace is going to draw in combustible air from outside. Uh, that's going to move air around, especially on a mid-efficiency furnace. And there's lots of mid-efficiency furnaces out there and a lot of low-efficiency furnaces as well. Not everybody's got a high-efficiency furnace yet. Not everybody's got a, um, a high-efficiency heat pump yet. But uh, they are coming, and uh, they are out there. Uh, to buy a, uh, a mid-efficiency furnace today, unless somebody has inventory or stock, you're not going to get one. I mean, they're not going to uh, uh, stop them from selling them. I mean, that's uh, uh, really, they're out there, and they're in warehouses, and uh, if you want to buy one because they're less money, then that is your call, not, uh, not our call. But in any event, moisture level from 50 to 40, it's impossible if it's got to be, say, anywhere from 60% up outside because you've got an influence of air coming from outside inside. Open a window, what happens? You take and uh, turn on a bathroom exhaust fan, which you would be doing in this case, yeah. and what do you do? For every cubic foot of air, it goes outside. There's going to be a cubic foot of air come in from outside inside. So you got that air moving. So in order to reduce it below that, the only way you can do that is introduce uh, air conditioning, and air conditioning happens to be dehumidification. Well, who wants to air condition this time of the year when yeah. a lot of people have got the heat on already? Yeah. So it sounds like to me that uh, uh, this particular uh, uh, email from Dale, and Dale is in Merritt, uh, up in the, uh, the mountains. Uh, Dale, it's not something that you should be concerned about. If you're concerned about going from 50 to 40, why? Why are you? Are your towels not drying quick enough? Or is the bathtub or the shower not drying up quick enough? Because if that's the case, then use your soiled towel after you've had your shower or bath. Wipe everything down. Take the towel and hang it outside somewhere where it's not going to give off all that moisture. Because again, you let it dry inside. What's going to happen? The moisture is going to go inside the home again. So, you know, you got to uh, really... Uh, understand that uh, moisture just doesn't all of a sudden uh, uh, come about without you aggravating with open doors or air infiltration uh, or uh, uh, not uh, drying up after the fact of a shower or bath. Uh, for example, your dryer, where does that exhaust to? Uh, all these things have to be controlled. But uh, very simply, going from 50 to 40 this time of the year, it's not going to happen unless the moisture level outside is below that 40% that you want to achieve. The colder the air, the less the moisture. Okay, that's the rule of thumb. When you have zero degrees outside and 40% moisture level inside, that is what's called dew point. Dew point is going to have a fog form on your windows or condensation on your windows. So just keep in mind, dew point is going to be where you're going to have that aggravation of moisture forming by means of condensation. So it is just that easy to understand, but uh, I just thought I'd bring that up in that manner. That way it will give you an idea of just uh, how difficult and how impossible it is to do it, especially when it's outside right. already. Especially with so many factors that go into... Uh the humidity, Absolutely. you can't just say it's going to take an hour. You, you bet. And even boiling a pot of soup. Yeah. You know, that pot of soup is giving out that steam. If you're not exhausting it through a range hood, that's going right into the home. Well, you got big rover running around. <laughs> Dog, <laughs> you're going to have moisture. You're all, and you know, it's just relative humidity starts out by activated moisture being produced somewhere. So get yourself one of those uh, humidistats. You know, you can buy them at your local uh, hardware store or building supply store, and they're a uh, hygrometer. And that hygrometer will give you where your relative humidity is, and it'll tell you exactly where it is. And another thing, you're in merit. 
Next time you're in the Lower Mainland, drop by our office because we got a great book, which is free, Keeping the Heat In, and it covers all those items. Right. So it's just that easy. And we did have a homeowner call our office this week who was upset because her son's bedroom, when he woke up in the morning, all the windows were uh, had condensation on them. Well, and also he closed his door. And he closed his door, kept it airtight, so you're breathing all night, you got the heat in there, it's colder outside, so it's you're going to get some moisture on your windows. When you get moisture uh, from the, the human body or moisture that's being formed through a crawl space, uh, space underneath your home that has got high relative humidity coming up through the subfloor and into the room with the door closed, uh, and you're going to have condensation. If it's in behind drapery or in behind Venetian blinds, you're going to have condensation. you got to vent. So, and I know a lot of people say, sleep with the uh, bedroom door closed for safe and for security. But on the other hand, you got to understand what it's doing if you don't have the furnace running, say, constantly. And if you have the furnace running constantly, you got to have the doors cut off so the air will pass under the door back to the return air to the furnace. Right. So those are all items that are covered within the book, keeping the heat in. So there you have it. Personally, I'm a cold weather sleeper, so I usually leave my window open a crack anyways, and uh, I live in an apartment where it can get a little noisy, so I leave a fan on year round yep. just to have that For noise. For that ambient sound, yeah, and yeah, yeah that, uh, what do they call that, uh, that, uh, that noise uh, level that you want to maintain? Like the white noise. White noise, yeah, yeah. there you go, yeah. Next email. Yeah. I have an outdoor faucet that used copper pipe that froze and split over the winter. I always drained it carefully in the fall, but obviously I didn't do a good enough job. I have not had it repaired for several summers now, as the job would include getting under a deck to access the pipe where it passed through my basement wall, and I have been using the front faucet for all my watering. I was wondering if I should replace the split pipe with PEX pipe. I was thinking if there was some water left in the PEX, it would expand in the winter instead of bursting like copper. I have had PEX installed extensively in my basement to replace rusted iron water pipe, and I'm quite happy with it. Thank you, Michael. Well, Michael, uh, very good questions you bring up, but uh, no, you don't need PEX, and uh, there's nothing wrong with copper. The main thing is when you do replace the outside faucet, which is the one that you're having a problem with, then put it in what's called a frost-free uh, faucet and that frost free faucet puts the valve inside the home or inside your basement area so you don't have the freezing where a lot of people make the error and this is an error that's made constantly that they will for example uh, take their old pipe put it in the new frost free unit and they have still the inside shut off in the crawl space or in the basement well, if that being the case, then when you shut your water off by means of shutting the faucet off, the shut off valve inside the basement area, once you've shut that off, then go outside and open up the valve or the spigot outside. Open it up. That way it drains the water that's between the valve and the spout. And should you leave it open all winter? Leave it open all winter, absolutely. And uh, you will know that it's open when you have to, uh, for watering purposes in the spring, go down underneath and open it up again. You'll hear it running outside. And uh, so, you know, it's just the, uh, uh, I guess the information and a lot of people, what they'll do, and I've suggested it many times, that the kitchen cabinet door where you go to most, be it a glass, uh, you're always, or the coffee cup or whatever, put a little note with a sticky note right on the inside of that door, when you open it up, say, when you turn faucet on, turn the water off outside. The main thing is make sure your hoses are taken off. Okay, so many people leave their hoses outside and they don't even drain the water out of them. Well, everywhere that hoop is, when it's rolled up on the hanger, all that low area being what we used to uh, call the gravity area, you've got uh, half a loop of water in each one of those turns of the hose wrapped up on the holder. So you want to take that off, put it in the garage, but first of all, 
put it overhead and drain it out. Get all the water out of the hose and then put it away into the garage or put it away in the crawl space or down in the uh, the basement, whatever the case may be. It's really, it's so simple that it becomes somewhat of a, uh, uh, what would you say, a frustrating experience when you see just how simple it is not to run into frozen pipes. But PEX does not expand, so I just want you to know that. Uh, PEX may expand when it's to the point it's so hot that it's going to melt, but uh, that's not going to happen with water to an outside faucet. So uh, forget the PEX, go for the copper, but go with a frost-free bib. It's just that easy. Make sure you go when you purchase one, make sure you go prepared with the thickness of wall. Is it a 6-inch wall? Is it an 8-inch wall? Is it a 10-inch wall? Or is it a 12-inch wall? Because all those frost-free bibs come different lengths mm -hmm. for different wall depths. Yeah. Just that easy. Beautiful. You are listening to episode 73 of the AskShell.com podcast. Shell is answering emails that I am reading from homeowners. And Shell, uh, we, we've had blog number one of your Ombudsman released. Yes. Uh -huh. We had the intro last week, but now you're actually into it. Uh, two to three minute video blog where you uh, give some tips for homeowners. This week was on having a new furnace installed. Absolutely. So many of you are going to be involved, folks, on uh, purchasing a new furnace. And uh, using our referral network uh, or not, the main thing is make sure they do a heat load calculation based upon your home square footage and the size. Very, very important because your duct size, which you have now in your home, your return air size, all of these things are very important when you're dealing with a quality furnace contractor. So we're also on Instagram, so you can go to Instagram or you can go to my blog, which is on the, uh, uh, on the Facebook. Uh, so it's all there for you, all the information, making it just easy for you. So go for it, the information's there. Yes, on Facebook, we've got the full two to three minute blog. On Instagram, it's shortened down to about a minute long. How do they clip. get it in uh, Instagram? Uh, Instagram, you can search for at Shell Buzzy. At Shell Buzzy. And you will show up, or they can just put into the search bar Shell Buzzy, and you will show up there. Uh, Facebook, Shell Buzzy's House Smart Home Service Referral Network is the page. And uh, like it, favorite it, and you'll keep coming back to it because we put lots of stuff up there on the Facebook page. And that'll be going across the bottom of the uh, the screen when they're watching it on their monitor. For the video, yes. Uh, if they're listening to the podcast, they're going to have to go to the video to watch it. Yeah, it's just that easy. And it is Om Buzzyman. It's a play on words, but it's certainly the information that we're helping you with your, con well, your concerns or your problems in and around your home. So check it out. And stay tuned later on in our show. We are going to have a question and answer submitted by Tony Giaventu. Your condo question. He oh, is yeah. with CHOA, the Condominium Homeowners Association. Back to the emails for you, Shell. This is a garage heating concern. Mm -hmm. I had never intended to heat my garage, so I did not add a vapor, a vapor barrier when I sheeted the walls with Jiprock. Now my business has outgrown my basement workshop and I need more space occasionally to do my woodworking finishing. My questions are, number one, do I need to have a vapor barrier to heat only once in a while? The walls are insulated with rock soil batting and when not using, I would like to keep the temperature just below the freezing point. Number two, what would be my best and safest option for heating in an area that I will be spraying waterborne finishes and using oil-based stains. Okay, now did I understand on the question that he has no vapor barrier? There is no vapor barrier right now, yes. Okay, but he has the insulation rock saw, which is a rock wall insulation. Yes. And drywall, and which is gyp rock over top. Uh, over top, yes. I don't know why he would do that. I mean, why, why, why would you do that, folks? That step's not that big a step to skip. Well, and, and the whole purpose in the, uh, the vapor barrier is to stop moisture from penetrating or permeating through the wall. And to, uh, to have the insulation, even though rock salt insulation will not support moisture, that does not mean that it will stop moist air from passing through it and come in contact with the outside wall. 
So really what you're going to be required to do is to uh, purchase, and you may have some difficulty purchasing this, um, is, where is that uh, caller, or at least that email from? Did it we? is unknown. It's unknown, eh? How do we have an unknown uh, email? Anyway, but if you have a supply source of paint, you could use a vapor barrier paint. So if you go to a paint supply store, and if you're in an area where there's a Cloverdale paint store or any other brand, ask for a vapor barrier paint because otherwise I'm going to have to suggest that you do go over top of the poly I'm sorry over top of the drywall with poly and then go over top of that with your new uh, in garage product that you're going to end up being a finish and that I would recommend plywood now a lot of people will say you could use plywood because plywood has got the glue layers or veneers and that would act as a vapor barrier keeping in mind that you would have to have a vapor barrier at the seams and also in the corners so I'll let you decide which way you go on that very likely I would go with the plywood and uh, going with the plywood or even OSB at least it's going to form that vapor barrier uh, requirement now keep in mind fire uh, etc so with the drywall you've got the fire break with the drywall you should have a, at least a 5 8 fire coated uh, drywall or gyp rock in there anyway so again that's a saving grace factor heating is what you're concerned about heating I would be going with a radiant heater you can go either with an overhead radiant heater which is the natural gas or electric and if it's electric, then you're going to very likely have to upgrade your uh, uh, amperage at that particular level or being in the garage. If your panel is in the garage or if you've put a panel out in the garage. So those are options, but radiant heating is definitely what I would recommend. But along with that, I do want you to be uh, very, very much aware of the fact you should have exhaust ventilation as well. Exhaust ventilation when that relative humidity comes up you want to exhaust and the more you're going to be working in there you may be working with uh, for example acrylic uh, water-based paints and that again if you're spraying it you're going to be dealing with the fact of moisture again so relative humidity get uh, a relative humidity indicator which is a hygrometer and then you can follow the moisture levels and have your exhaust fan hooked up to it so therefore it comes on automatically so, uh, but as far as heating, radiant heat, uh, gas and or electric, uh, you'll find very likely the gas being the, the most uh, inexpensive. But on the other hand, you are not using it all the time. So therefore, radiant heat heats what you're going to uh, be required to heat only when you have the radiant heat on. So it's not necessary with a forced air system, for example, to heat the entire garage before you get the temperature up and also aggravating moisture. So there you have it. It's just that easy. Thank you very much for that call. It's a good one. This will be the last email I have for you, Shell, before we get Tony Giaventu on. Uh, well, his question at least. I have a cultured marble sink and countertop in our bathroom. We have noticed a number of hairline cracks have appeared over the years around the drain. The countertop itself is in great shape, so we, re we would prefer repairing the sink rather than replacing the whole one-piece unit. Is there something we can do to repair or paint the sink bowl to make it less noticeable? Thanks, Diane. Well, Diane, you bet there is. And uh, you'll be so happy to hear what it is because for the cost of repairing a cultured marble sink, you can go out and buy a new sink, whatever color. Uh, it, it, mind you, colors are not that popular anymore, but white is uh, by far the most uh, uh, common I would say then what you do you cut the old cultured marble sink out and you use the pattern that comes with the uh, the new sink the template pattern if you want to call it the pattern but the template you would very simply mask it down on top of your cultured marble uh, uh, sink top and uh, draw a line and take a uh, 
a saber saw, which is a lot of people call it electric jigsaw, and uh, you put a, uh, uh, a cutting tool blade in the uh, saber saw and uh, cut it. And uh, it, it's very soft, actually. Cultured marble is very soft. A little more dusty than the average uh, plywood, for example, but uh, cutting it, uh, you can use a metal cutting blade, for example, or you can use a carbide blade or a hardened uh, uh, steel blade, and it will cut that very nicely. But put the new sink in your faucets, hook up the drain, and bingo, away you go. It's just that easy. So don't even think about repairing the sink because it doesn't last, number one. Number two, it's as expensive as buying a new sink. And you might as well get the new sink and do it uh, up to date uh, ways and means because what you have now is countertop and sink combination. Mm -hmm. Whereas that is fine if you're to buy a new countertop with the sink. You know, cultured marble is available out there for you. But if you're going just to replace the basin of the sink, just go to a new sink. It's just that easy. Interesting. Is yeah. that a DIY job with the Oh, yeah. DIY, if you're inclined. Yeah, if you're inclined. If, if you're inclined. It's like everything tools. else today. I mean, if you're not inclined, then you'll have to have it done for you. But uh, there are... Uh, there, it's not a big job, and most people today are taking on some of the do-it-yourself projects where you can go out and rent the tool. You don't have to buy the tool, for example. You go out and rent it. Uh, Home Depot's got rental. Uh, many private uh, organizations have got uh, uh, tool rentals available, and uh, pretty well on every city uh, uh, corner somewhere, there's uh, a couple of uh, rental outlets. So there you have it. Well, Shout, that's all the emails that I have for you. Now but for Tony. We do have Tony's question, so I'm going to read Tony's the question that was submitted to Tony, and you have Tony's answer that you're going to get to. Yeah. So uh, this is a question submitted to Tony Giovantu, the Executive Director of the Condominium Homeowners Association. Dear Tony, our strata approved a project in August 2013 for painting of our townhouses. Most of the funds were taken from the contingency fund, but we also had a special levy cost that cost each unit $350. Two owners did not pay their levy, and now one of the units has sold, and the lawyer for the seller is refusing to pay the levy, citing the limitation period. The amount was only for $350, so we didn't see the point of filing liens or court actions or legal advice because it would have incurred more cost than the levy. Is there a better way for Strata to collect small amounts without incurring unrecoverable costs? Thank you, the Evergreen Strata Council. Well, thank you very much, Morgan. And uh, folks, I just want to reiterate uh, what we have uh, mentioned on this show uh, uh, from time to time, and that is Tony G. Eventu uh, is uh, very much involved in Strata affairs uh, throughout the province of British Columbia. He is the executive director of the Homeowners Association and uh, where the condos and townhouses and apartments and uh, uh, bare land stratas, all that uh, fall under. So we do rely on Tony's answers which are extremely good and uh, one of which I know has taken care of a lot of concerns by uh, owners of stratas. So the answer uh, for this particular question uh, that Morgan just read, which is uh, quite a good one. And really, there are a number of uh, strata owners that don't like levies. They like things to be taken out of contingencies, but there's also some uh, contingency funds. When they do draw out of them, they'll draw a certain amount, and which leaves, obviously, the outstanding to be divided up uh, for levies. You don't want to drain your whole contingency. Well, no, and uh, $350, uh, I have to say, uh, if you don't have it, it's a lot of money, but uh, it's something uh, a levy normally is quite a bit more than that, mm -hmm. depending on what it is you're doing. So uh, here is his answer from Tony Giovanto. Dear council members, claims for damages or funds owing in British Columbia are established by Limitation Act. In 2013, the time limitation for collections was basically reduced to two years. 
collection of small amounts for special levies, fines, user fees, damages, and alteration agreements is just an important is just as important as a major special levies and strata fees. You are correct to commence an action in Supreme Court of BC. There is a minimum cost to consider because of the legal and court costs, but there are steps that can be taken that will secure the debt to avoid running out the two-year limitation period. If an owner does not pay a special levy, strata fees or permitted interest, the strata may, after issuing a demand notice of payment and after waiting for 14 days, the strata may file a lien against the strata lot. In addition to the amount owing, the cost of the lien, including the reasonable land title filing and legal costs, court registry fees, and other reasonable disper disbursements may be added to the amount. And that's the amount that's owing. For the owner, this is a significant penalty as it would likely double the amount owing from a $350 levy. Filing a lien does not stop the clock running on the two-year limitation period, but it does secure the debt as a priority. If the strata is approaching the two-year limitation period and the owner has not acknowledged they owe the debt, the strata will be required to commence an action in provincial court, that's a small claims uh, court, uh, Supreme Court of BC, or once the Civil Resolution Tribunal, which is abbreviated CRT, comes into effect later this year. An action commenced under the CRT will stop the period from running out. One of the benefits of the CRT, that is again the Civil Resolution Tribunal, is that the Strata Council will not require a bylaw authorizing provincial court actions or a three-quarter vote of the owners to commence a Supreme Court action. This will enable Strata Councils to respond to most Strata issues much quicker. In addition to fees, bylaw fines, damages, and insurance deductibles, the Strata will be able to address bylaw enforcement that may include ordering an owner, tenant, or occupant to do or stop doing something, whatever it happens to be. It is essential that Strata Corporation, Strata Managers maintain a monthly list of receivables and identify when they may be coming to a two-year collection so the Strata Council may start an action on the debt. So there you have it, folks from Tony G. Aventu, and the CRT, that's the Civil Resolution Tribunal, is being put in place, and it will be in place this fall, and it's something that will save tremendous dollars for strata councils, strata councils within your building complex to do what is right, but for less money. So take it under advisement, folks. And it will be uh, a final result instead of chasing your tail around, uh, going back and forth between. You just uh, don't want to uh, chase uh, your tail around. And, you know, really, it is something to today, no matter who you are. I mean, we live in a strata. And uh, we have uh, run into situations where it is very important to uh, get off your duff and get things uh, done and get them done properly. But it's amazing the number of things that will and for no uh, reason, possibly, fall through the cracks. Now, in this particular case, obviously, the previous owner was aware that they owed the $350 because the levy, obviously, was uh, not paid and they didn't pay it knowing it was there and outstanding. So to leave it for the realtor or for the legal presentation of the purchaser of the, uh, of the uh, strata lot, then it's something that... Uh, it has to. Somebody's not just going to uh, uh, walk down the hall in a uh, condo and say, here's $350, pay your bill. Mm -hmm. It's something that you're responsible for. So it's just that easy. Take it under advisement. Well, Shell, we've come to the end of episode 73. Uh, homeowners out there, if you want to have your question answered in episode 74 of the AskShell.com podcast, it's easy. Go to AskShell.com and ask Shell a question. It's submitted via email. You can do it anytime, any day of the week. 
And uh, Shell, we'll look forward to episode 74. Absolutely. Number 74, folks, coming up your way next week. And uh, let us not forget, lest we forget, our uh, Remembrance Day program, which will be actually next week uh, on uh, item number 74, or at least uh, it'll be uh, uh, podcast number 74. And uh, we don't want to forget those that have made it available to us, a free land, a free world, and a loving relationship within our whole community, our country. Lest we forget. Love you all. Talk to you next week. Bye-bye for now. Thank <laughs> you.